Water runs off our buildings, driveways, and sidewalks. It runs off our yards and gardens. It runs down the street and into the storm drains, carrying pesticides, litter, soap, and motor oil. Then it flows into creeks in the bay. You can prevent this pollution by using less toxic garden products and washing your car at a car wash instead of the driveway. Only rain should go down the storm drain. Learn more at cleanwaterprogram.org. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, go quickly into an introduction of my friend, Stephanie Preugel, who's going to be giving the talk, Keep Your Garden Green Longer with a Rain Garden. Hi, Stephanie. Hey, Kathy. Thank you. Let's go ahead. I, I just re-watching that uh, little plug for the Clean Water Program. Um, I noticed, you know, it was so much about pollution and it still is. And it is also now about just conserving water and keeping it on site so we get re can recharge the soil and have that water for our plants and recharge the water table. So um, I'm gonna share my screen and get into my presentation. So I'm gonna talk today about rain gardens. And the one you see here on the slide is actually a garden that's on the tour on May 6th. So you can go see it in Panol. We're gonna talk about all the gardens that have rain garden features and are on the tour. So give a preview of those. And if you're interested, go come see them in person. Um, but before we get into the actual rain gardens, I want to take us back just for a moment to that crazy winter we had with all the terrible flooding and damage that happened in urban areas, agricultural areas, traffic mayhem, and just kind of foreshadowing what is probably not going to be very isolated or just a once in a, a century, but kind of more of a, a standard thing and where our the, the kind of infrastructure we've had to deal with rainwater and what we call stormwater or runoff. Um, doesn't work anymore. You see here a storm drain. You can't even see the storm drain because it's so uh, flooded. Sandbags are kind of washing up against it and mud and pollutants. So the system is overwhelmed. And uh, one reason for that is that um, the we we have not allowed rainwater to get into the soil the natural way. So when it really, really rains, like we've had those atmospheric rivers, then it, it really fails. Um, so you see on the left here, what's in a, in a natural area, you know, the water that rains down uh, can largely infiltrate or soak into the soil. There's sort of two types, some more shallow infiltration that's more available to the roots. The deep infiltration is what really recharges groundwater that we often hear about that we've pumped out to such large amounts that even areas are sinking because it's been so depleted. So because we are more like that area on the right, like urban areas, even where we have our gardens, it's largely sealed off. There's um, on average and often it's like 75, even 100% impervious. So basically concrete and, and uh, streets and roofs and buildings and structures on top of it so that on average, there might just be 15% of the water that comes down that goes into the ground and, and recharges the groundwater uh, or feeds our plants, the rest runs off, some of it evaporates. So 55% runoff, runoff typically in the city. So um, it goes into storm drains, as Kathy said, and we saw in that little video, it then actually goes directly into uh, creeks and the bay and uh, surface lakes and wetlands. This is actually from the Berkeley shoreline, one of those outfall pipes where the water comes out. So um, that's sort of the pollution issue, but of course also the, the flooding and just losing that water. With all this rainwater, we know we're gonna have a dry summer again, and there it goes all off into the bay. Um, it's also often an issue in, with our properties. I hope all of you guys watching have not had major damage with the storms. I have friends who have had um, the property like, like flooding, water coming in, erosion, um, when it comes down in, in a large amount close to your foundation, that, that's a problem. So uh, 
the solutions here are to really try as much to keep rainwater on site. And um, this sort of little graphic here is actually Clean Water Program Alameda County. They uh, put out a, a brochure, it's also on their website, and just pointing out what are the ways to keep rainwater on site. Um, there's trees, you know, they soak up water from saturated soil more than if you just have lawn or very small plants. So that's something I sometimes forget. Uh, rain gardens we're going to talk about today. Um, the number three here goes to disconnected downspouts. So many properties can't even get to the downspouts. They go directly into the storm drain system. Uh, you'd have to disconnect, sometimes unbury them to, to capture that rainwater that falls on your roof. Um, there's rain barrels, maybe the one of the more known ways to keep uh, water on site. And one uh, very little known one is pervious surfaces, where instead of paving your driveway, you have uh, permeable pavers where in between the cracks or through the whole paver, water can penetrate into the, the ground. Um, we are gonna talk about rain gardens today, but here's um, a picture of um, my tanks and cisterns, uh, the rainwater tanks. I wanna say great way to keep rainwater on site, but as you can see, it takes a lot of, you have to have space, you have a stable ground surface or create one for these heavy tanks to sit on. They're not cheap. And um, I wanna say, if you have tanks, which is a great thing, you still may wanna consider a rain garden for the overflow. I'll talk a little more about that. So rain gardens um, are essentially landscaped areas that are designed to receive water that runs off typically your roof through the gutter or comes off of uh, paved surfaces, especially if your property is on a slope, you may have seen that. And those areas then um, capture that water. They're often lined with rocks to prevent erosion where that water enters the area and then allows it to sit there and slowly get into the soil. So it's a pretty, a uh, straightforward concept, and you might have heard the slogan, slow it, spread it, sink it. So slowing it with those rocks as it comes gushing out, uh, uh, you, you sort of break the velocity, you kind of put rocks in its way, so it has to slow down, it can't erode as much, it kind of stays more on site, and you give it more space to sit there, not rush down to the storm drain and then sink in, that's what you want. You want to use your garden soil as a sponge, essentially. It's sort of your, your underground tank equivalent, if you will. Um, they come in very different shapes and forms. So the one you see in the picture is more sort of, a, you know, often in the middle, there's the rocky or gravelly area surrounded by plants. Um, I'll show you before I go into more shapes uh, where that water typically comes from. So in this is uh, my house and I would love to have a rain garden. Um, I don't have one yet, which is also part of why I wanted to do this presentation. But you see the gutter uh, coming down there right now, it just drains into my landscape, kind of concentrated in one area, doesn't flow off the property, but it would be nice to, to spread it out more. And then on the right, the photo is of my overflow from my rainwater tanks. And I have um, 3000 gallons, which is a lot, but with those very heavy rains we've had, they, they way overflowed. So the, the overflow, that white pipe coming down um, is currently connected to kind of a drain pipe, flex pipe goes into the, the garden, but I have to sort of move it around to not concentrate it too much in one spot. So rain garden here is my next step. Um, here's, you may or may not be able to see this, uh, a very sloped uh, property. This is before the homeowner put in a, a rain garden and just, you know, um, remove the lawn in general, but you can see how it slopes downhill. If you have heavy rain, it'll just be on the sidewalk and, and in the curb running off. So the sort of general anatomy of a rain garden, that's sort of this, this uh, cross section here is again, fairly straightforward. It's basically a depression in the landscape. Um, often there's amended soil at the bottom, especially if you have a slow draining clay soil, you may want to have a, an amended layer with compost mixed in before you start planting. The, the place where the water comes in, say from your um, overflow from rain, rain tanks or such, often has rocks to, to uh, prevent erosion. And you also want to think about an outflow. So if that should fill up and it's a really crazy rainstorm, does it have somewhere to go? Uh, so that's just a basic 
concept and now two rain gardens and how they look so varied. Um, so in this one here, uh, you see the gravelly area sort of in the middle of the photo and it's hard to see that it's actually a depression. Typically rain gardens are a foot and a half or so, a foot to a foot and a half below the, um, the area around it. So it does go down there, collects there usually where gravel is. And then plants, we'll get a bit more into that. Uh, the ones are, that are closest to the area where it, where it sits the longest until it absorbs fully are plants that are fine with that, that don't mind actually like wet feet, like rushes you see here in the picture. And then toward the, the berm and the more upper areas you choose um, can be more drought, uh, drought favoring plants, or just a lot of plants that, that really are fine with either. Um, but the rain gardens don't have to be kind of oval shaped or roundish. Uh, there can also be rain gardens sort of adjacent to a walkway that is maybe sloped, gets a lot of um, runoff. And here on the left, that water then would flow into that gravelly area and this kind of dry stream bed uh, that looks beautiful when it's dry, but when it rains, that is then an actual mini creek in your yard that um, meanders in a way that the water has time to absorb in between those rocks. Um, let's see here, here's another version. This is actually in a side strip. So you see those um, boulders uh, in around the middle, long stretched part, that's the lowest line part. Um, I'm not sure where the downspout or how it feeds in there, but that's an option too. Whatever you choose, if you try this on for size for your own yard, there are a few rules you wanna think about. You should be at least 10 feet from any building foundation. And that's just because you don't want water sitting near your foundation. And obviously you wanna be down slope from your the source of water. So from your roof, from your gutter um, to receive that water. Where your rain garden is, that should not be on a slope. So, you know, it comes down the slope but then that should be a fairly flat area just so it can actually receive that water at level. And um, well-draining soil is best. Uh, if, you, if it's not well-draining, you, you may want to do a test. There's tests to see how well your soil drains. Uh, amendments can help with that. Now about the size. So uh, there's sort of a rule of thumb. Um, if you think about, say, oh, I want to get the water uh, from a certain area of roof and maybe has one downspout and that downspout goes into your um, rain garden. You wanna think about 4% of that roof size roughly. And of course, if your soil is less quick to absorb water, you might wanna make it a little larger, but that's uh, just sort of a general guideline for a not super deep rain garden. This one, you know, six inches, often they can be deeper. So if we put that into a little more sort of graphic um, interpretation here, like say you have a 20 by 25 feet uh, roof area, 500 square feet. So 4% of that is what you see here, the little green tile, the ratio here, that would be the size of your rain garden. That would be at least 20 square feet to receive the water from that size of roof. And as I've looked into um, rain gardens that we have here and that are gonna be on the tour and that I wanna share, most of them have had landscaper help. And, uh, but I have also seen rain gardens that are DIY, that are uh, designed by folks themselves. Here's sort of the, the basic steps would be that you lay out the shape, often a sort of kidney shaped or you know, long, depending on, on your available space. You dig out at least six inches of soil, uh, level out the edges. Um, if you, depending on the quality of your soil, you wanna mix in um, compost into the bottom 12 inches, it's quite a bit, so be prepared to dig a bunch and uh, line it with rocks where water comes in for sure. And um, rocks in the center are also pretty common and look very nice. So before we go into examples, just briefly covering the types of plants generally that work for rain gardens. There's just such a variety. I had a really hard time just giving some succinct examples. Um, so you can see they can be super colorful. I've 
just pick three for each of those general zones. So if you think about the bottom that has the most, like that's where the water might be standing the longest or sitting or just being kind of moist and saturated. So um, rushes are really great. There's Yerba Manza that, that does very well there. Um, a bunch of other uh, bunch grasses like California black flowering sedge looks beautiful, the carexes. So those would be sort of your, your bottom plants. More toward the middle uh, are plants that uh, like moisture. You have here like the, the dogwood. Pete showed a bunch of beautiful dogwoods. They have the, the red twigs when, when the leaves are gone. Uh, scarlet monkey flower, unlike, unlike the bush monkey flower, actually likes moisture. So that's a, a good one. And then irises also thrive in that still pretty moist area. Um, more toward the top, I realized I forgot to swap out the Ceanothus picture. So don't put the dogwood there. You want plants that are a little more drought tolerant like the rest of your garden potentially. Uh, Ceanothus works, the bush monkey flower works and the California fuchsia is a great choice there. They're pretty hardy. Um, let me show you a few gardens that have been on the tour. The next couple are not on the live tour, in-person tour on May 6, but you can uh, look at them, read the descriptions, check out the photos, learn about them on the Bringing Back the Natives website, and I'll show in a later slide where you find that. Uh, here's Dale Walford's garden in Castro Valley. This is a before picture, and it's so interesting because um, he has a sloped front yard where the lawn was. That is where water would run off and probably ended up on the sidewalk. He put in um, this rain garden and you see it's sort of a little more from the side. There's this depression where the gravel is. That is now where the, the water gathers and has time to absorb into the ground and not run off. So it recharges the ground, stays on site. Here's a, a view of it from a bit more up to the side. You see the fuchsias, he has, um, Verbena, um, the, uh, the green juicy looking uh, ground cover there, that's a uh, coyote bush. And another really fantastic uh, rainwater catchment garden is uh, Lorraine Calichis in San Ramon. And this is especially something for rock lovers. She really made sort of the issue of runoff into a design element and just went all out on rocks and their beauty. I even looked up the kind of rocks she used. It's a smooth Noya cobblestones. Uh, Lodi pebbles and yellow moss rock and Calistoga boulders. So um, they all combine to create a really beautiful landscape that's also super functional. So um, I'll show you just a few pictures and then show you where the water runs. So this is going off uh, next to the, the walkway. You don't see how much the depression actually is there in these pictures, but I'm gonna point it out where the circle is. This is the first picture, there's the downspout. So then just like a meandering creek, that water comes along the pebbles and in that sort of at least a foot deep um, creek bed, dry creek bed here, and just travels along, absorbs along the way, feeds the plants. Here's the other picture where it kind of comes a bit around the corner and uh, slopes down with the landscape, uh, sort of blocked by more boulders. So it really slows down and has time to absorb. Her um, walkway also is sloped. And here's an example of where it just runs right off the walkway and into this uh, uh, rain garden area to the right. So highly recommended to check out those pictures online. There's a few more and she has a beautiful video that really shows you well how this could be designed. So a, a real win here for design, even if you thought you needed to deal with runoff. Uh, I'm now gonna go to the, the gardens that are actually on the tour this year. There's four of them. I hope you can check at least one of them out on May 6th, that's uh, Saturday. Um, I'll come back to the slide if you want to write it down, but we're going to look at Jen and Roland Mathers garden in Planol. You saw that at the uh, for the cover. Um, they have a a fourth of an acre property. It's fairly sloped, uh, sort of drains toward the street. And here is the uh, about 10 by 15 feet large rain garden in the front. And I learned from Jen that this is where pretty much all of the runoff from their property goes. They have a few rainwater tanks, so the overflow also 
comes into here. But this is sort of a workhorse of a rain garden. It really um, takes a lot of water over the rainy season. Uh, this is what it looked like before. You can see the sloping and of course the much less attractive lawn. So here the arrows show you where the water comes in. So from the left, it runs off from the sloped walkway directly into that lower lying area. You see from the right here, barely visible, there's actually a pipe. So they have hidden drain pipes. So this is fairly engineered. And I wanna say, Jen is a landscape architect and she specializes in this kind of work, uh, green infrastructure, as it's also called, basically engineering these, these uh, rain gardens and, and um, uh, rain garden features. So uh, they have French drains around the house um, that also uh, send water here. They have, um, what else? Um, another gutter that goes direct here. And these, this, um, that brown part you see here comes from probably the most amount from um, the French drains and from behind the house, from the patio. Here are their two rainwater tanks, I think a thousand gallons combined. And those overflows also lead to uh, the rain garden very nicely hidden. I couldn't really, I had to talk to her to see how it all gets channeled there. Um, here's another picture in the late summer, just before a lot of the rain happens. So you see it's kind of parched. Uh, I think they don't irrigate at all other than with the rain tank water. And you see the, the yellow circles where that pipe comes in and toward in the front, you see that sort of bluish green round uh, thing that's a, a pop-up emitter. So the water comes in, but when no more water pushes it out into the depression, it closes so no dirt or insects and stuff gets in there. Couple more pictures of that beautiful rain garden uh, with water standing here next to the rushes and uh, same from, from the other side, uh, there's an elderberry. I haven't identified all the plants, but she has a great plant list on the website. So you can look all that up. Here are pictures of some of them, beautiful dogwood, uh, she has beech strawberry and California goldenrod, which is also one of the more frequently found rain garden uh, plants in the more sort of upper areas. So see her on May 6th. With all your questions, then I'm going to move on to an, another beautiful garden that's going to be on a tour on the tour on May 6th, and that's Jamie's in Oakland. So Jamie Marnes in Oakland has um, this this riotous color in her backyard. A lot of annuals. You can't even see where the rain garden is, but it totally reminds me of the super bloom. You know, after long years of uh, or winter with a lot of rain. This is, however, from last summer. So. When you have a lot of water that is kept in the soil because you keep it on site, you also um, uh, have more of a boost for your annuals and everything else. This is what it looked like before. They had um, a large uh, concrete patio. And um, if you wanna watch um, the work they did to take that out, she made a video called Conquering Concrete, it's quite entertaining. Um, that they turned into after a lot of uh, you know heavy work there into uh, this first step of making a rain garden you can see how they laid out a very interesting shape um, the boulders uh, surround the higher uh, the higher areas where the yellow arrow is that's where the water comes in and again they actually had sort of um, standing water issues so it was also a property protection as well as um, just keeping rain order on site uh, goal here that they had. She said uh, that since they put in the rain garden, um, that's really helped with um, the, the water standing there in the corner in the winter. So next step, they um, mixed in compost and added soil to those um, beds here that are elevated. You can clearly see that. And here are some pictures. This is a bird's eye view on the left just a couple of days ago. Uh, it's with all the plants, hard to see where the, the um, rain garden now is, but you see sort of those cobblestony areas. Those are um, where the water gathers and there's an elder bear in front. That's the Anothis in the back, that's the Skylark, uh, beautiful in bloom. 
she has um, all these flowers also. Um, you see in this photo, that sort of standing water to the right and the monkey flowers and all those happily blooming flowers uh, clearly don't mind having some moisture there next to them. So visit them on the six uh, gorgeous garden. Another one in Oakland, those of you who were on the tour a little earlier today uh, saw Lois talk so eloquently in her videos about the design for Marianne Walsh and Richard Carter's garden in Oakland. Uh, here's a front view of the house and uh, you see all the wonderful rock work they did and the side strip that, that's also worth checking out. Uh, what I'm going to look at primarily is the back. We saw in the video the dry creek bed and the wetland area that feeds into. So um, I think um, they shared that actually their downspouts, they couldn't disconnect. They are buried. But all the rain that falls on the sloping property in this area in the backyard does get channeled into this dry creek bed and over to that little wetland area. And, and here it is again from the other side, a little closer. Um, you see right in the middle, there's one of those rushes that we often see in rain gardens. I believe it's a seed monkey flower that's also right there in the middle, likes um, uh, wet feet at least part of the year. More toward the back where it's drier, there's the evergreen current against the wall. There's bush monkey flower. That's one that wouldn't want to have wet feet. And there's also a ribes. I wanted to show this photo of this uh, amazing rock that Lois uh, incorporated into the design, but also from a rain garden and rainwater capture perspective, because you can see how there's almost like this little terrace of gravel above this stunning rock. And so water coming off the property uh, gets gathered there it, and held back. So another place where it can absorb. And yeah, note the side strip when you go visit to check it out. Briefly, the last one uh, I wanna show you is in Fremont at Ellerbrock's uh, garden. Um, I'm gonna go to this before picture that I grabbed from his video. He made some really cool videos. If you wanna really see more of his rain garden, I recommend watching those. Um, so this is what it looked like before. Uh, here is the same view you see in the yellow circle, the curb cut. So there used to be a sump pump that just funneled all the water from the back area to the street. And Ed basically interrupted that flow with this uh, creek bed that then leads us into um, the, his rain garden. And I'm starting in the back. So here's the rain garden. You see the meadow, there's uh, the water running through the meadow. Um, getting absorbed, trickling into the soil, coming here through the uh, pebbly area, this dry creek bed. There's, there's um, buckeyes, there's sages, there's um, buckwheats. And uh, here is, we're back at the front. So very rarely Ed shared with me, there's a little bit of overflow into the street, but that's just in those crazy, really crazy rainstorms. For you, as a reminder, again, those um, gardens that are on the tour and six. And if you can't make it or, or you and or you want to look at all these other gardens that have been on the tour and where we have information on this on the website, I made a screenshot shot of uh, the website. You see here on the home page where it's circled uh, on the on the left, find a garden. Just put in rain gardens in, into the search uh, bar here. And there's 47 gardens that have some sort of rain garden feature. So check them out. And there's also new resources. So you go to gardening info on the homepage. And we posted a number of guides, how to fact sheet that really talks you through how to measure how large yours should be, how deep, um, more plant recommendations. Uh, also information on other ways to keep uh, rainwater on site, like rainwater catchment um, and such. And I know this was a lot of information, but thanks so much for listening. And I'm going to stop sharing the slides and see if there's questions. So we, we just put up a new section on the Bringing Back the Natives Garden Tour website under uh, garden information on rain gardens. And there are about half a dozen links there that would be useful to people. I have to tell you guys that um, 
I have not, um, full disclosure, been to any of these gardens. And it's now I want to go, but I'm hosting myself. So, so it's it's really worth going going and checking it out in person. It's almost impossible to really, really <laughs> how it all exactly fits together. That was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. So let me ask you if, uh, if you're viewing to please fill out the evaluation that was in the links because it's very useful for us to um, hear like, what did you enjoy and what was a good presentation? If you are watching today and haven't had a chance yet to make a donation, if you'll please support the tour. You can do it on the tour's uh, website under please donate. You can Venmo a contribution to at bringing back the natives. We depend upon donations to keep going. And we hope that if you've enjoyed our presentation, that you will help us to keep this event going.